Okay, we'll get started. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Richard Joy. I'm the executive director of ULI, or the Urban Land Institute, Toronto. Um, and it's a great pleasure uh, to present to you in a format that wasn't the original intention, which was to have been a live town hall meeting in the North York Civic Center. But instead, as is the time, um, we're, we're coming to you by way of a webinar. Um, so we're pleased to have so many of you join us in this format. Um, very briefly, for those of you who don't know who and what ULI is, um, ULI Toronto is a chapter or a district council of a, an international organization of the same name um, who has a global mission to advance the responsible use of land. Um, we are primarily comprised of professionals uh, who work, multidisciplinary professionals who work across many different uh, uh, professional disciplines um, and across also the, uh, both the uh, private and public sector. Um, we are not an advocacy organization, um, but we are an organization committed um, to elevating um, strong dialogue on matters of land use as we are doing, as we hope, tonight. Um, so um, great to have all of you join us. Very briefly, um, this particular program, well, let me, actually, before I go, let me, let me do a little housekeeping. I forgot my prompts. Go to the housekeeping, there we go. Um, everybody won't be surprised. That there's quite a few hundreds of people uh, um, in the audience today um, will be uh, muted uh, throughout the session. Um, it isn't going to lend itself, unfortunately, to live uh, questions and answers uh, through the chat room. Um, because of uh, just the, the sheer number of people and the, and the tight program that we have. However, we are highly encouraging people to present their comments and their questions using the chat uh, room function, um, because we are gonna be recording all of these, uh, as is the whole uh, program being recorded, so that we can submit these to the city uh, for its consideration as it launches the formal process of what tonight's topic is all about. So please do submit the questions, but just apologies in advance that we won't actually be able to address them in this format. Um, and finally, if you're using uh, 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 Twitter, um, there's a hashtag, hashtag Kurtner Leadership, or our Twitter handle at ULI is at ULI Toronto. Um, all right, go to the next slide, um, and it'll, it'll give me a little bit of opportunity to set this up. The Kurtner uh, leadership program uh, is now in its fourth year running. Um, it's a mid-career program of multidisciplinary professionals from both the public and private sector. Um, and in the past several years, the Kurtner Leadership Program has uh, taken this, this, this uh, 25 to 30 mid-career professionals uh, and focused on a neighborhood that looks like it's going to undergo significant transformation as a result of development pressures, the market, what have you. Uh, and we've done this uh, in, in a number of neighborhoods, uh, in the, the uh, Bloor Dundas area, in um, the main, uh, Blue, uh, Danforth main area, and most recently in Mount Dennis. Um, but this year we've changed the focus to something that is citywide. Um, many of you will know, and you'll hear more about this from Deputy Mayor Anna Balau and from Chief Planner Greg Lintern, who are on the program, um, that the city is taking review of its stable residential neighborhoods that some people know as the yellow belt because that's the color uh, on, the, on the official plan, as you can see on this map, um, that, the, that this, these neighborhoods um, are, are, are coded. Um, and um, this is a generational conversation, um, questioning you know, what, how well the uh, yellow belt is performing um, and what possible opportunities are there to look at the public policy guidelines that impact the future of the yellow belt. Um, so we've started our program this, this year with this map um, that was designed by former chief planner, uh, Paul Bedford, um, who, whose handwriting you can see here on this practical uh, paper napkin. Um, and this map that started uh, a city hall tour, uh, started at city hall in October, took us through a fairly um, wide, um, swath of Yellow Belt. Uh, it didn't get, unfortunately, because of time restrictions, it was a very long day. It didn't get all the way into Scarborough, um, but it did cover uh, a good chunk of, of, of the old Toronto, of Etobicoke, um, and uh, North York, 
and uh, York, uh, sorry, East York, uh, and, and into the beaches and back to City Hall. Um, this was an opportunity for us to examine um, different ways that these stable residential neighborhoods um, have been built out over the years uh, as a backdrop to um, having a, uh, an examination of the future policy uh, of uh, this, uh, this area of the city. Um, we were joined by a number of, of, of dignitaries, uh, and two of them are, I know, um, listening in, a, in the audience today, uh, Councillor Brad Bradford, uh, whose photo you see with the former chief planner, uh, Paul Bedford, who is our dean of our program, uh, and Councillor John Fillion, uh, also with, with uh, Paul Bedford, uh, along with some other uh, photographs. There's, there's, there's our chief planner, Greg Lintern, and one of the participants, Cheryl Case, uh, at the bottom of those three photographs. Um, okay, so, and then the last uh, photo I think I've got is the, is the group itself, uh, and you're going to hear from some of them. Um, th this is the group of mid-career professionals, along with some of our guests, uh, who, who were on that bus tour, uh, including a, a number of the community members who were a very important part of this program, um, as we were looking to bring as many perspectives into this exploration as a sort of a table setter for the so-called yellow belt uh, review um, and that's uh, that's the photo uh, that we took at the end of the tour uh, in the beautiful beaches um, the uh, last thing I'm going to uh, before I, I hand it over to where I'll come back to you before I and then introduce uh, Deputy Mayor Anna Balao is to uh, show you a video that some of you have already seen perhaps on social media um, that tees up um, sort of a little bit of what we're doing tonight uh, and sets us up for a really interesting program ahead. Um, so cue the video, please. Technology is always great when it works. Okay, we're just having a little hiccup here. Uh, and uh, I might uh, take the moment to, to uh, thank uh, Ryerson City Building Institute uh, who produced this video and a, were a participant uh, along the way in the program as well. And I think here we go. No sound. Toronto is the fastest growing urban region in all of North America and Europe, with 100,000 people moving to the greater Toronto area every year. Like many large cities, Toronto faces a housing affordability crisis. Many residents either can't afford to buy or rent homes close to jobs and services and are increasingly priced out of the city or live in precarious housing. We lived here together for about a year and a half. And it was great because we had a green grocer right next door. We had a health food store on the other side. We got an eviction notice, the N12 notice that landlord's family member is moving in. So then we moved into a new apartment. And Our we rent went up quite, yeah, substantially, <laughs> quite substantially. And we've actually been rent shamed for how much we're paying in yeah. rent right now. Most housing in the city is being added in the form of tall condos in high density clusters, which are expensive, not suitable for all family sizes, and pose challenges to livability, like not enough green space. Instead, many experts would like to see lower scale housing distributed throughout Toronto's neighborhoods, often called missing middle housing. Where I grew up is actually a great model for what we should be seeing across the city because in my neighborhood we've had people from all uh, walks of life, all incomes being able to share uh, community space. So there are areas of Toronto where the only thing that you can build is a detached house. And if you can't afford a detached house, you can't live in that area. But maybe through expanding permissions for missing middle, you can build an extra apartment in your house. You can turn your house into a triplex. Uh, and those will be more affordable options that will expand the range of people who can move into a neighborhood who are currently just completely priced out. The big problem is that roughly uh, half to two thirds of the city only allows detached houses to be built, nothing else. There are all forms of different housing choices that people are quite comfortable with in terms of, you know, duplexes, semi-detached, triplexes, little apartment buildings. Those kinds of housing choices, generally speaking, aren't permitted in most of the city. 
Toronto is at a 30-year record level of condo development, and yet a decade of the biggest condo boom in history has not produced affordability. Will adding more density to Toronto's residential neighborhoods result in affordable housing? Some residents remain skeptical. Generally what the market has provided is massive, massive homes, um, really responding to the top end of the market, not to the affordable lower end of the market. Other residents are concerned about loss of tree canopy and impact on neighborhood character. They're splitting lots and every time they split a lot, they're taking down a mature tree. People will say that I don't even recognize this street. These more affordable houses are being taken down and it, they're being replaced by two far more expensive houses. It's actually driving up the cost of housing in our neighborhood. In September 2019, Toronto City Council asked Toronto planning staff to examine the opportunity to add housing to Toronto's residential neighborhoods. How can the city unlock the yellow belt in a way that respects neighborhood character and offers affordability? For decades and decades, people have talked about the need for more rental housing. So I've developed a repeatable six-story mass timber build. Windows front and back, an elevator access to each floor is barrier-free, and it's really effective one or two bedroom housing. We really haven't finished dealing with the main avenues. And there's a huge opportunity to do it here. This building here represents a gentle intensification to an existing street. All three bedroom units, there's opportunities that exist to add two or three or even up to four families. So the densification is much more gentler. What we have in my ward is a lot of land speculation. So everything is driven by what makes the most profit for investors. There are a lot of residents in my ward who have adult children who they would um, be very happy to live in a multi-generational house with. We are building an intergenerational house in central Etobicoke. But it could really be a house with two families that are not related or multiple families in the future. Over the past six months, teams of experts from the Urban Land Institute's leadership program have been exploring these Yellow Belt solutions. They will start conversations at a town hall event with decision makers, planners, city builders and residents. Given the housing affordability crisis, the lack of places for young people to live, all the issues that we read about in the papers every day, that's the challenge. And I'll tell you something, they're really into it. In June, join Urban Land Institute's Town Hall to talk with city officials, residents, planners, and other experts about how to build housing in our neighborhoods that works for all of us. Thank you very much. Uh, my apologies for a little bit of a video glitch there, but I think you uh, saw more or less the, uh, the teed up message uh, um, that that video conveyed uh, quite, uh, quite nicely. Um, with that, I'm, I'm going to move the program along. Um, first, I want to just uh, uh, introduce uh, Andrew Garrett, uh, who's the Executive Director of Real Estate Portfolio at, at IMCO, um, but he's also, perhaps more importantly uh, to, to me, uh, it is the co-founder of the Kirtner Urban Leadership Program and the current um, ULI Outreach Committee co-chair. Um, Andrew is going to be our Master of Ceremonies for tonight, um, and he will come on right after uh, uh, Deputy Mayor Anna Balao speaks, uh, which is right now. Um, and I will now introduce uh, 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 Deputy Mayor Anna Balao. Um, it's a great pleasure, in fact, to do so. Um, many of you will know that uh, um, Deputy Mayor Anna Balao has been the a champion of affordable housing uh, for many years now uh, and has been one of the drivers along with the, the councillor 
uh, Brad Bradford and the, and the mayor uh, behind um, the review that the city is about to undertake. Um, and her leadership uh, has always been highly appreciated by, uh, by us at ULI Toronto. Um, so she will speak for uh, about 10 minutes and, uh, and then uh, Andrew Garrett will come back on and, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll conclude, uh, we'll be our driver for the rest of the program. And that's the end of me for the evening, but I'll be looking forward to a great program. Thank you, Anna. Over to you. Thank you, Richard. Um, uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, the advantages of uh, uh, the, web, the webinar is that uh, I believe there's probably a few hundred. That's what, uh, what I was told uh, just before the meeting. Uh, but it feels like I'm just having a conversation at the dining table. So that's what I'm hoping over the next couple of minutes, just to have a conversation uh, with you and, and uh, why the, this interest uh, um, has started with me. Um, I, uh, I came to Canada in 1991 to Toronto West End, the area that I have the privilege of uh, representing today. And at that time, um, I think that um, almost everybody on my street um, had at least a couple of families living in their, in, in their house. Uh, secondary suites were very normal. Uh, this was a very blue color uh, neighborhood, working class neighborhood, and a lot of the people lived that way. And um, the area has changed and uh, I continue to live in the neighborhood. And a few years later, I was actually going to meetings in the community about the school closures that were happening because there were no kids in this neighborhood. Uh, as we know, things have changed and uh, neighborhoods gentrify, uh, especially in, 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 in certain areas of the city. And a lot of people wanna come back and live in the city. Um, but as the video has shown, uh, sh shown, there is clearly an affordability issue. And uh, many people wanna buy, wanna rent, wanna continue to live in this city. Um, and, um, and they're having a very difficult time. And as we look at the housing spectrum and look for solutions, um, a lot of people in our city started talking about this missing middle. How, how do you create more housing options? And when we put this motion forward last year, I have the reaction like I always do when something is put forward on housing. Well, this is not gonna break, this is not gonna solve affordable housing. Of course not, because there's not one solution that is gonna, uh, solve the affordable housing issue that we have in our city. But it could potentially have uh, an impact on affordability in our city if done right. And that's, I think, where the city wants to go. It's to have a robust consultations with experts, with communities, uh, with the city, to make sure that we have a policy that creates that level of affordability, but also brings the social benefits that come with a policy that could open some of these options for multi-generational housing, for co-housing, for uh, you know, um, multi-tenant uh, uh, housing, you know, small rental apartments that were built decades ago and now our zoning would not probably allow and in, in, it would not allow uh, in many of the areas of our city. So how do we create that policy uh, with an equity lens, because for me, this issue has a big equity uh, um, uh, issue attached to it as well. When we, we are saying to somebody, for example, in the neighborhood that I represent, and I'm sitting here in my dining table and looking around and saying, well, if you can't, if you can't uh, uh, buy a home for a, a million dollars, uh, you probably won't be able to live in any of these neighborhoods. And if you live in other parts of uh, the city, it's 800,000 or, uh, but it, there's, there's, there's a price tag that is a hefty price tag that if we open the door to different housing option, options, you are creating the opportunity for certain families with different incomes to live in that community. Uh, you're also creating the opportunity for the social benefits of, of having uh, that. Also, the way that we're doing our public investments, uh, you know, we are, in, we are investing in public transit, we are investing in infrastructure. How can we take that money further? How can we make sure that in, that investment goes further? How do, do we take advantage of the infrastructure that we already have in the city uh, by create a density uh, that is that it respects uh, uh, the neighborhoods that we have, but uh, it actually responds to the needs of those communities? How do we support the small business in, in businesses in our main streets? How do we create that density that supports 
uh, that community? How do we give a city where people can very easily go to a store, very easily go to their school, very easily go to their doctor? So that is uh, how I see this uh, uh, model moving forward, is how do we create a city that people have these serv services that are accessible, that we have a city, a city that has good public transit infrastructure and that people from all income levels have easy access to it, uh, that it has a good infrastructure for pedestrians and that has good uh, green infrastructure. That's how we will build a resilient city. That's how we're going to bring resilience to our city. And, uh, and I think um, it's time that we have this conversation. We don't have the answers. Uh, I think as you'll see from Greg, he'll, he'll, he'll explain the process that we're um, entering it with. We do believe that it's time to have the conversations. We have this. Con we want to have this conversation uh, with Toronto, and for that, we thank. We, I want to thank the ULI. I want to thank the team for starting uh, this conversation because um, um, it's a great start, uh, much needed start, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, to continuing uh, uh, hearing from you, listening, and working with you um, to make sure that the changes coming forward are. Um, uh, appropriate and in response to the needs of our communities as well. Andrew? Great. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor and I really appreciate having you with us today and uh, really thank you for your strong, uh, you've been a strong city housing advocate. Um, welcome everyone, uh, really excited to have uh, this great amount of participation in today's town hall. Uh, I'm going to speak a little bit on the, uh, I guess, the genesis of the program to give some people some background uh, and then we'll move towards a, a panel on community voices and uh, that's going to be moderated by Liz McCarty and uh, we'll speak there and then it'll be followed by the ULI leadership uh, program teams. They will also present, uh, you know, obviously they've been working at this for eight months, um, but have a short period of time to distill that. Uh, but uh, they're going to distill that as, as best they can, and, and we're going to have more concrete put in and we'll be able to respond to it during our town hall, but um, everyone's going to have some access to that as we go forward. Uh, just a little bit, again, as, as Richard mentioned, uh, the, the genesis of this uh, happened a number of years ago when we, you know, we looked towards a lot of professionals to in the city, build, city building environment, whether they're public sector or private sector, uh, would have a specialty in certain areas. Um, there's a gap in that middle part of your career where you've, you've, you've built some technical skills, whether it's spreadsheet tools or whether it's renderings and so on. Um, but we realized in a lot of the training it, that there wasn't an engagement with real community and, and community needs and being responsive and, and so built this program uh, so that we wouldn't just have managers, but we build, build leaders. And uh, the great part of this is it, it really uh, concentrates multidis multidisciplinary teams and their expertise on a real world engagement. And the benefits really twofold, I think for a lot of the participants, who've uh, been working over the number of months here. Uh, it, it helps them to build their skills, uh, working with different experts in different areas and build their network of who they can call for on to problem help problem solve. Uh, and, and at the same time, at the, as an outcome, uh, there's a benefit to community as essentially uh, on the area of focus for providing a lot of pro bono consulting um, to help uh, look into these issues and uh, and over the past years uh, there's been great progress in what various cohorts have been able to bring to the table in terms of uh, transit oriented development uh, again as a uh, deputy mayor and Abel mentioned there's no one uh, silver bullet to solving affordability so uh, looking at various pieces and some some affordability practices that the prior groups have brought up uh, have been put into practice uh, and come up with practical uh, solutions. So I do encourage people, if they have a chance, go to the toronto.uli.org. That's kind of the website. Uh, and under the Kirtner Leadership Program, you can see what past uh, groups have put together 
uh, and I think they've made some really important contributions. Um, so this year, as we mentioned, is uh, housing choices is, is the focus. And uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Liz McCarty, who's the uh, CEO of Laura Consulting, and she's a moderator uh, for housing choices uh, panel, and she specializes in organizational design, uh, collaborative planning around community and corporate sustainability uh, reporting. So I'll turn it over to Liz. Okay, great. Uh, thanks so much, Andrew. Yeah, Richard's right. It's funny when you are used to presenting in front of lots of people and then all of a sudden you're sort of, um, not Richard, but uh, Deputy Mayor Bailau, and then you're, it's like you're sitting at your kitchen table. Um, anyway, it's great to be here, virtually that is. Um, as Andrew mentioned, my name is Liz McCarty and of course um, I have the opportunity to uh, help us chat with four awesome people on what we've called the Community Voices and different perspectives panel. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask each panel member, um, and we're gonna go in the order of the images on the screen, uh, to turn their video on and just quickly introduce themselves. And then I think we'll get into our conversation. So how about Cheyenne, let's start with you. And just say your name and yeah. your organization, yeah. Hi, I'm Cheyenne Sundance. Um, I work at a year-round urban farm called Sundance Harvest, and I'm also a renter. Okay, great. And over to you, Kathy. Yeah, I'm Kathy McDonald. I am the co-chair with Jeff Cattell of the Federation of North Toronto Residents Associations. Okay, to Billy. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. My name is Billy Dertillis. I am owner of uh, Red Rocket Coffee and chair of the Danforth Mosaic BIA. Okay, and to Tanvir. Hi everyone, my name is Tanvir Shanawaz. I'm currently an office manager for MP Nate Erskine Smith here in Toronto's East End, as well as a condo owner, owner in Crescent Town, which I'll get to in more detail. Okay, fantastic. So the way this is gonna work, um, we've spoken to each of the panel members and they're gonna talk about their sort of overall vision for their community, aspirations and potential changes, concerns or opportunities. Each panel, panelist has about three minutes um, to share their perspective. Mm -hmm. And I encourage each panelist as you go, uh, don't feel shy to ask questions of one another. I'm here to help you um, move it forward. But of course, you've got lots of ideas and perspectives and folks who are participating tonight really wanna hear from you. Of course, part of my job is to keep things on time. We have until about 6.55, so I will be working to make sure we match that time. Um, I think we'll start, uh, if we could start with you, Billy, that would be great. And Billy, you're on mute. Apologies, but can you hear me now? Yep, we can, can hear, hear you perfectly. Excellent, okay, yep. well, thank you again. So yeah, um, I, I, I probably won't even take the um, three minutes that I've been uh, allotted. Um, you know, I come to this topic uh, from two perspectives. Uh, one is as a storekeeper and a leader in uh, the business community. And the second is as a private citizen. And, uh, you know, as, a, as someone in business, uh, what I can tell you about my part of town is that the Danforth uh, used to be a high street with uh, mixed uses, commercial, industrial, residential. Uh, it was an urban center in and of itself where locals could live, work, shop, and entertain themselves without having to leave the area. Um, it had very slow traffic and it had a tramway, a streetcar, so that residents and uh, visitors alike could hop on and off as they wished in order to visit retailers that caught their eye. Over time, uh, it's become a traffic corridor that runs through what is um, in, 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 in essence a bedroom community. Um, there's less foot traffic, there's less sales volume, uh, there's less independently run shops and less community and few residents today in, 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 uh, in on the Danforth or in many parts of, of the city, I would argue, um, spend their entire day in or around the area that they live in. And um, let's be honest, um, you know, uh, same as what um, um, uh, Councillor Bilal said, um, the Danforth is less populated, populated now than it was a generation ago. Uh, you had large families with lots of kids, all frequenting the retail shop. 
Um, so for, uh, for the business community, anything that we can do to increase density and foot traffic is, is, is a net positive for us. And uh, with respect to uh, COVID, you know, we don't know whether the current trend of working at home and no longer commuting to the office will last, but if it does, uh, what a great opportunity to get back to something similar to what we had on the Danforth so many years ago. Um, uh, from the second perspective, as a private citizen, um, I mean, the normalization of one hour commutes each way to and from work is being questioned and uh, rightly so. Um, let's, let, let pe let's let people live closer to where they work. Uh, let's create less pollution. Let's consume less. Let's ask ourselves how much is really enough. And uh, maybe we'll see that smaller is better. And uh, that's about it. I don't know if anyone has any, any comments or questions for me. Okay, thank you, Billy. Um, we'll move to Cheyenne next, but first to the panel, does anyone have any questions or comments for Billy? Yes, my, uh, it's Kathy. My comment is that um, he's echoing uh, Anna's, Anna Bellow's comments about the need for, I guess, what planners are calling complete communities. Mm -hmm. And that this is a very important part of what's needed. Precisely. Okay. Great, Kathy. Okay, uh, Cheyenne, up, you're up. Cool. Hi, everyone. Um, so my opinion as affordable housing, the missing middle and the yellow belt all comes from a perspective of someone who has been a renter for my whole life. My parents have been renters, my brother's a renter, I'm a renter. Um, and I really, I do think when the conversation about affordable housing mm -hmm. comes into play, we're commonly going to be thinking about, well, who needs that? And there's a stereotype of the young single mother, the low income youth, the maybe the young undergraduate who just can't really find a place to stay that's affordable. But it goes beyond that. Um, affordable housing helps the majority of the population, the working class, people with precarious employment, uh, folks who have part time jobs, writers, creative people, musicians, the people that we like to see the movies of, like directors, all these people that really influence the culture of Toronto also need affordable housing. And I feel like when we're talking about affordable housing, it's very important to note that the majority of people in Toronto aren't really wealthy, they can't really afford to outright buy a home. And these are the same people that are influential in the patchwork and the framework of our city. So like drawing on what Billy said, it really makes the community, when you have the community, get to stay. So um, actually focusing on the missing middle, focusing on affordable housing will ultimately help Toronto's communities thrive. Kensington Market, Chinatown, they're both distinctive communities that have amazing different attributes and traits to them. But without affordable housing, those same people who've made Chinatown, Kensington Market, or even Little Italy where I'm living today, um, will be gone. And that's a part of me too, because I'm one of those folks who was an urban farmer who's really trying to make ways in Toronto, but I'm being pushed out. So I'm probably gonna to have to leave in a year or two simply because I can't afford the rent. And when people like me, my friends who are artists and creatives, have to leave, you're really gonna get a town and a city that's quite soulless. You'll have a Tim Hortons and a Starbucks on every block, but will that actually keep the community? And will that actually encourage more people with these dreams, ideas, and projects, these change makers and movers and shakers to stay? No, it won't. And really when we're thinking about the longevity of Toronto and the kind of city we wanna see in 20 years, without affordable housing, you're not gonna have a city that is um, creative and that is has hope to it and strength. You're going to have a city that's kind of generic. And I feel like that's a perspective of a renter, but that's also a perspective of someone who is within a community. And it's seeing my community slowly shaping and changing with gentrification. So that's a bit about what I have to say. And obviously, affordable housing is a matter of justice. Housing should be a right. People should have safe shelter. But we should also think about what kind of city do we want to create and understand that, that affordable housing has a key integral piece to that point. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Cheyenne, for that. Uh, let's let's open it up to the to the panel with any comments or any questions on what Cheyenne or building on what Ka uh, Billy has been saying as well. I like the comment that you know we should be um, def uh, perhaps looking at the definition of what we mean by affordable housing and who's actually going to live there. And uh, Cheyenne's right; there is uh, there is a preconception of who needs it, 
Um, and, uh, and, but, you know, when I look at, uh, my experience and also what I've been talking about with respect to, you know, who was in this neighborhood before and what kind of working families, we're talking about very industrious and very productive people that are contributing to society. It's just that they can't afford a million dollar house, you know, so it's, it, I, 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 I appreciate the, uh, the uh, sentiment. Thank you, Cheyenne. Great, thank you also for weighing in, Billy, and certainly this, the definition of affordable housing, we're seeing it coming through the comments as well. And what does that actually mean? Um, and, you know, Cheyenne, to your point as well, many of the people who we need in this city are being forced to leave. So how do we stop that from happening? Um, Kathy, I'm gonna throw it over to you because I know um, you have a lot to say about the complete community equation, um, as well as your, your phenomenal experience in this city. So Kathy, over to you. Okay, thank you. And uh, thanks for including Fontra in this really important town hall. What's, um, the, the Fontra community has over 30 residence associations in the area so bounded by Bloor, Bathurst, Shepherds, and Don Valley Parkway. We've got older pre-war neighborhoods, like many like Deer Park where I live, um, with all kinds of the yellow belt typologies, including uh, small apartment buildings and the current zoning to build them. We've got post-war subdivisions, car-oriented and primarily single family houses. And we've got two planned communities, like the uh, complete community that um, Anna was talking about and um, uh, mentioned uh, again, uh, Lee Side and Don Mills that have um, single family housing areas and other areas for housing and everything else. What we are noticing as the only recent development that's happening in all of our neighborhoods has been to replace single family houses with larger ones, more expensive ones, or semis or townhouses. And as Jeff showed in his slide, these, these new houses are not necessarily uh, uh, fitting in with the existing neighborhoods. So here's uh, what Fontra sees as important objectives for the Yellow Belt study and some of the changes needed to get there. Our first objective, of course, is to ensure residents have a strong voice in planning our neighborhoods. Residents know their neighborhoods, what works and what's, um, uh, what's needed. And based on our ongoing work with the city, where we believe that uh, there should be neighborhood working groups to ensure residents and all stakeholders in the neighborhood are true partners in the development of Yellow Belt programs for their neighborhoods. Uh, we need to see changes in the Committee of Adjustment rules and for T-Lab so residents have a real voice in helping to ensure that bylaw variances are really appropriate for the neighborhoods. Um, we need to ensure that new development fits the character of the area this is the heart of official plan policies for neighborhoods. The new housing typologies uh, certainly can and must be designed to relate to key aspects of the area character, uh, such as the elements of the prevailing building forms, heritage buildings, tree canopies, how parking's provided, etc. So here are some of our priorities. We need to develop new official plans, and thanks for the, the note, Rashmi. Um, and clear zoning regulations for the different uh, types of building typologies in the different neighborhoods and support these with good design guidelines or make use of a development permit system. Uh, we need to restrict committee of, of adjustment variances to ones that are really only minor uh, to, avoid, to avoid disruptive surprises. We need to strengthen programs that protect mature trees and can encourage more tree planting. We need to reduce the financial barriers that currently discourage the building of a range of these typologies, uh, such as eliminating development charges on new projects and um, also uh, providing for uh, different kinds of affordable housing within our neighborhoods. So our final objective um, is uh, 
the uh, objective that Anna had first introduced, that the Yellow Belt Initiative must be in, undertaken with the conjunction of developing really complete communities. Locations in complete communities can be more attractive to investment in new housing types, as well as help meet challenges like um, those raised by COVID, climate change, um, et cetera. So Fontra is looking forward to working with the city, the ULI and Ryerson in the ongoing development of these initiatives. Okay, thank you, Kathy. And you're all sticking to your time, which is amazing too. <laughs> uh, anyone on the panel have any comments or questions or want to build on anything that Kathy has said or something Cheyenne said or Billy to date? I do again. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm, very, I'm very talkative tonight, but I no, think, uh, Kathy, thank be, you. But only Kathy, till 6.55. <laughs> Kathy, thank you for that. I think, I think you brought up a lot of uh, very salient points. Um, there's one point I would want to add, and um, you briefly touched on the uh, financial barriers uh, that, um, that make it hard to build this type of housing. Uh, but I think something we need to look at is the financing of this type of housing. The fact that it's very hard to find any capital or to source any capital to do a project that isn't either a monster home or a high rise. And perhaps there needs to be some work to be done. I, I don't know at what level of, of, of what government, I'm not sure what the solution is, uh, but there needs to be money made available to uh, people that want to build something that maybe won't make as much profit as, you know, as what we're seeing being built today. Okay, great. Thank you, Billy. Um, okay, I'm going to move it over to Tanvir and last but not least for comments. Thanks so much, Liz. And thanks for everyone for joining in and, uh, you know, giving your time for us. Uh, very humble to be a part of this panel. And I'm um, Again, very humble to be asked to provide some insight and experience. I, uh, I live in an area that is uh, known as Crescent Town in Toronto's East End, nestled um, immediately east of Victoria Park Avenue and uh, immediately north of Danforth Avenue. And um, you can say in a, south of Eglinton and um, as well nestled to the west by Main Street. Um, it's an area that is um, very well known to many folks um, for being very densely populated. Um, we have about five high-rise towers um, 30 floors at least in each of them with about 20 units per floor. So you can imagine a lot of units. Um, so very densely populated. Um, all units, including condos and rental apartments, were built right around the same time in the 70s and uh, were built within walking distance from a TTC subway station. But as well, in a, a few more um, few more steps will take you to another TTC subway station as well as a GO train station. So I will say that there is a wonderful access to a lot of very meaningful transportation for many folks that live there. Um, as well, um, we are by major arterial roads, including Victoria Park and Danforth, and um, the population is um, overwhelmingly made up of many second generation or newcomer immigrant population to the area, primarily of South Asian background, including myself of Bangladeshi heritage. Um, Crescent Town has, uh, is considered a hidden gem to many in terms of the convenience to such important amenities um, at our, you know, at our footsteps. Um, to Billy's point about, you know, being a leader on the Danforth, uh, we are a bit more east of Billy um, on the Danforth. And, you know, as a, as a juxtaposition, we actually have a quite a thriving local, um, you know, BIA there where it's made up of many of that South Asian community that lives where, where Crescent Town is. And so we have a walkable population of shoppers and of consumers of 12 to 15,000 people where many cannot afford to buy an automobile. So they rely on that, the ability to walk to an arterial road like the Danforth and having the, you know, the, 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 the accessibility to a subway station as well as a GO train. However, you know, um, I'm not here only to be able to showcase why I live in a wonderful area, you know, much like everywhere else in the city and including the rest of the Yellow Belt, there are challenges. Um, because of uh, the proximity to so many things that many families, especially new families or who are hoping to integrate to this area would like to, um, you know, um, long for, to belong in, there is a limited capacity on how many units there are available to many to be able to rent here. And so you look directly across the street from what we'd call Crescent Town and immediately north of a subway station, there is a city of Toronto managed golf course 
in which I can tell you quite confidently that no one living in the immediate area is probably attending at or using in terms of that facility. And it makes you question the viability of such an amenity like a golf course, you know, being um, so close to where we live, but perhaps it's not being used uh, effectively in terms of who can, they can cater to as opposed to, um, you know, that attributing to, you know, what I would want to think is a complete community. Instead of that, I would hope that we can have an opportunity to think of building more affordable housing, um, more gentle uh, densification for many who would like to live in such an area. Thank you. Okay, Tanvir, thank you. Let's let's open it up. Uh, open it up to the panel um, for anything on what Tanvir just said, or to build on Kathy, Cheyenne, or Billy. Yes, I'm. I always impressed with uh, the comments about Crescent Town and uh, the importance of community uh, in that area and how much it. Uh, is meeting the needs of the people who are living there. So there are different different ways of providing complete communities. I um, really like the piece, Tanvir, how you spoke about the community in Crescent Town having walkability. And I feel like that's a really important piece, especially when we're considering affordable housing and, and people who are low income. They may not be able to afford a car to drive to Costco. Exactly. So really keeping these mainstays in our community like a fresh green grocer or a local pharmacy is like very important to make sure that affordability can match up with the community development because having high scale shops and affordable housing doesn't really match. Right. Mm -hmm. So having both and ensuring that the community there can actually still be served is very important. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, and Tanvir, we, we spoke with this before. I grew up in Crescent Town as well. And when I was a child, it was a, a very, um, very heterogeneous community there were people from everywhere and it, everything was close by and everything was in walking distance. And, and um, I think, I think perhaps it has uh, left its uh, left an impression on my mind of what uh, urbanization should look like. So yeah, kudos to uh, Crescent Down. I, 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 I recommend uh, that everyone look into it just as a, just as a case study. Well, it sounds like we are right now, and I kind of joke with Tanvir, you know, maybe we should keep this quiet or on the down low. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Happy to talk about Crescent Town any day. <laughs> yeah, but it sounds like, um, you know, what you've said in terms of Crescent Town and overall success, it's a very complete community, which has many of these attributes that we talk about um, that we need uh, in terms of, you know, in terms of what we're looking for in the Yellow Belt. Absolutely. And I, and I must say, like, you know, currently, and I, I am speaking out of the writing office for the local member of parliament who I manage the office for, uh, we actually just completed um, packaging a, a thousand or so masks to be given out to the writing today. So I would have, if, if I if I didn't have to do that, um, I would have probably been doing this from home, but I've hijacked my boss's um, seat for him to do his virtual parliamentary session. So I'm not complaining, um, but exactly because of my, my ability to also be on the front line as a out of a government representative's office, especially during the pandemic, you know, I so understand the need, and I might have mentioned this last week about um, you know just everyone's um, comfort with navigating through bureaucracies and handling a situation like a pandemic. And with Crescent Town as an example, with such uh, an overwhelming majority of folks who may not have English um, uh, as their their first language, what they're comfortable with, and not being able to navigate through, you know with the TTC, for example, with a driver or a fare collector, or, um, you know, m many other uh, aspects of daily life where, you know, you're not the most comfort, depending on the situation you have from where you're from. Um, you know, my family immigrating here in the 90s, we found such comfort with many folks who spoke the same native tongues as we did, who, you know, who have gone through the same struggles and challenges of immigrating here with next to nothing in their pockets, but, you know, trying to create that better life for themselves. And I must say in Crescent Town, where we have almost a split between rental units and condo units, um, you actually see many folks able to achieve some sort of social mobility. You know, while I was younger, my family was, were renters. Um, as I've grown older and I've been able to help out myself, we have, we've moved on from a particular building in the area to another one where we are now condo owners. And so again, like with, with this hidden gem that we joke about is there's also an affordability um, 
with owning property here. Mind you, with the rentals, they follow the same trend citywide of the rental market. And of course, you know, we hear the struggles that many folks have, but um, the affordability that we have here is wonderful. An interesting caveat would be though, that it seems to be that um, even owning property here is not enough for many people. They would hope that this will then springboard them to be able to maybe to own uh, a sing single dwelling household. But you know, as we've talked about already, what does that look like in reality? That looks like them having to move out of the 416 area because perhaps the property that they own here will not provide them with enough equity or an appreciation for them to still live in the city core um, where they'll have to dish out at least 800,000 or maybe even a million for a single gelling household. And so what you end up seeing is many folks um, who are second generation, like myself, uh, families, um, where you know they live in a 416 area, but then they then end up having to move out. Um, yet they, you know, their schooling is here for their families or they have to still commute to downtown Toronto for a career. Um, but at the same time, if you, if you choose to stay here, it's quite interesting. Those that choose to stay here tend to still be able to access the conveniences, but those who do not then tend to have to be spaced out with just the, how the market has dictated their choices. To the panel, anyone ha does anyone have anything to weigh in? Okay, well, I just have one more question before we wrap, uh, and I think we have three minutes just to be uh, just to be on time. Um, so I can't help but talk a little bit about COVID, right? And the shift that is happening. We don't know what that means. We don't know what that looks like. Um, however, there are more people working from home. There are people. Um, you know, that will affect affordability and that will affect housing choices moving forward. Can zoning help with this? You know, what do you see in terms of how this can affect affordability or help with affordability as part of this conversation? This Kathy, my, my comment is there are a lot, of, this is a time of great change and change, times of change provide good opportunities to reconsider how we're doing things and how we can make um, our lives better for everybody. And um, so this Yellow Belt study um, really is a, a, a opportunity to pull all these uh, disparate but connected components of our lives together and help make uh, Toronto a great city, a greater city than it is. So as a time of change, you um, see this as an opportunity. And, and Billy, what are, what are your thoughts? You know, I just think, and perhaps I'm taking this argument to a level of absurdity, but, you know, uh, COVID and transmission seems to go hand in hand with uh, travel. So, you know, if you take that and, and distill it to the most local level, uh, the more you can stay within one little area, the less um, uh, opportunity there is to catch uh, pandemic or to create or further a pandemic. So in that sense, I think, um, you know, the solution is really to um, develop more local nodes where people have their personal geography and they don't have to leave it. Um, so I understand there might be an argument to say, hey, we should all live further apart from each other so that we don't, um, you know, infect each other. But I don't think it's the case, you know, six feet let's say even 12 feet is enough. Um, rather though, I think the idea of us staying put, not traveling around uh, too much and, uh, and, and being within our, uh, our neighborhoods and building strong local economies, I think that is a very uh, possible solution. I think that my comments regarding COVID-19 and what's going on in the pandemic and housing comes from a place of seeing as many of us have already seen, read articles about people being evicted um, and otherwise cannot finding housing. So really, I think the pandemic is providing a catalyst. A lot of people I know, my friends, are understanding their housing rights, learning more about affordability, because in a pandemic, this is the worst time to be evicted. But if you don't have another affordable housing option to go to, where do you go? And I feel like affordable housing is a human rights issue because of this case, right? If someone who's been on an affordable unit for 10 years gets evicted during COVID, doesn't have any income, 
where will they go? But if an alternative utopia, we'd had more affordable housing, this person wouldn't be left out in the lurch. Their community may have not lost a community leader, a friend, maybe they're even local grocer or a uh, banker. Because these people who are being evicted are also community members. They have things to actually community as well. So I would say during COVID, um, is it maybe a time to start thinking about housing as a human right? but also housing as a way to soften the blow of pandemics, of emergencies, and also other um, things that could pop up that we would otherwise not see, such as emergencies. Great. You know, there's one more thing I could add. You know, we yeah. look at the the numbers in the COVID and the pandemic have really hit um, seniors living in 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 long term homes, um, and perhaps you know um, you know a, what are they, is it called aging in place when you can afford to divvy up the property you own so that you can stay in the same house forever. Um, uh, you know that I mean those seniors that are able and have the luxury of doing that have not suffered the same fate as those that are you know, hold up in, in homes with uh, PSWs and nurses that are being shared across multiple locations. So again, um, the idea of, of you know, um, taking the existing stock and, you know, using up those empty 2 million bedrooms that I've heard exist across Toronto, um, you know, that, that it's also, um, that could also be a net positive in this. Okay, great. Um, so with that, I would really like to thank the four of you um, for such an excellent conversation, Billy, Kathy, Cheyenne, and Tenvir. Um, you've really provided some awesome food for thought and, and definitely some community voices. Um, I'm gonna pass it back to Andrew uh, to carry forward with the rest of the, t the town hall. So thank you so much. Thank you, Liz. Thanks for um, moderating such a great panel and thank you for all the panel participants there, you know, really, heard a lot about whole community needs um, and, and I think some good perspectives on renters and maybe some of the stigmatization around renters uh, and, and access. So people want access to amenities, they want access to housing choices and, and uh, the COVID situation is a unique situation where I think we have, we, we have to rebuild but you have the opportunity to rebuild, rebuild better. So we're looking at how, how we can do that uh, looking to transition now to uh, hear from our Urban Land Institute team presentations. And, uh, you know, with a great group of professionals this year, and uh, they've been working really hard and they've been taking a lot of input. Uh, and they have this opportunity to try to distill a bit of the big picture, uh, some of the citywide context, some of the growth, some of the demographics, some of the housing choices, and, and really go through their findings and, and try to come up with practical findings that are based on precedent cases uh, where they've run the numbers, done some financial feasibility. So really look forward to this part of the uh, town hall. So we're gonna start with team one and team one spokesperson is Sahar Ghaffori and uh, she's the director of operations for North York Harvest Food Bank. And turn it over to Sahar. Hello, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate all the comments that have been made in the panel so far. Um, and I'm really happy to be here to provide some context for engagement and design as part of the um, ULI Kirtner Leadership Group. So it's been said many times, and I'll say it again, we're facing a crisis of housing where unaffordability and unavailability of appropriate housing is our most pressing concern. Um, what this means is people who make our city great are not able to afford to live here. There's lots of different factors that contribute to this, um, but in this presentation, we're gonna be looking at uh, how to increase housing density in the yellow belt by addressing the missing middle. Can we get to the next slide, please? Thank you. Okay, so a bit of a definition. What is the missing middle, for those of you who don't know? Um, it's a term that was coined by architect Daniel Paralek, and effectively it means what's demonstrated in these images. So it's not detached and a uh, single family home, and it's not mid-rise or high-rise apartment buildings. It's everything in the middle. So that's triplexes, duplexes, fourplexes, et cetera. So the question is, why is it actually missing? And that's because the city is largely zoned for single family detached or semi-detached homes. And most development happens in high-rise apartments. Next slide, please, Denise. 
this is the yellow belt. So this is actually the yellow part of the map, um, the area of the city that's comprised of RD, RS, RT, RM, and R zone, which is primarily detached and semi-detached homes. Um, it's all over the city, but a lot of, in Etobicoke and North York and Scarborough. Represents about 35% of the land area in the city of Toronto. And currently most residential development in the city is actually directed to mixed use regeneration areas, which are only 5.9% of the city's land area. So with that, we can see there's a huge untapped opportunity to add gentle density in the yellow belts to increase housing supply in the city of Toronto. And one of the teams will go into more detail later on. Next slide, please. This is a map that shows population decline in the city of Toronto from 1971 to 2016. Here we can see there's significant decline in the yellow belt region. Um, and some of this can be attributed to populations aging in place, children leaving the home, nests being empty, and families being unable to afford to move in. Next slide, please. So why do we care about the missing middle? That's the question. Next slide. Uh, there's plenty of benefits, and I'll go through some of them. Um, one of the issues is that nearly a third of family households who rent in the city of Toronto are actually living in unsuitable dwellings. This means that they're living in homes that are too small for their size and for their household makeup. This really shows uh, the importance of having larger rental housing types, which is typical of missing middle housing, as opposed to high rise units, which typically have smaller units. They're also more affordable than detached or semi-detached homes. A lot of the areas that are zoned are DNRS, which include the Yellow Belt, are definitely um, more well-connected and amenity rich and it's been stated many times. So uh, they're often closer to jobs, schools, parks, libraries, other public assets, as well as transit and bike infrastructure. They're closer to small businesses and main streets and they're more walkable neighborhoods. But as we saw, they're experiencing population stagnation or decline. Adding density will increase school enrollment and public amenity access and ultimately lower the cost of service provision in these neighborhoods, which will have the added benefit of lowering taxes. Having mixed housing typology will also allow for diversity in residents and support a mix of residents of different socioeconomic backgrounds, which we love. And walkability is shown to increase health benefits. So there's um, more decreased instances of chronic disease like type two diabetes and heart disease. Next slide, please. We are coming against some barriers now. Um, we have regulatory challenges. So zoning practices in the city, which um, are Team number two will get into in more detail. Uh, there's development costs. The cost of land is very high, so that's a barrier and a challenge as well. And uh, urban design and neighborhood character, which um, I'll go into a little more detail later on. Next slide, please. So community engagement. This is a very important factor in the success of adding missing middle housing. So uh, it's something that we need to highlight and, and pay a lot of attention to. Next slide, please. So community engagement has to be inclusive and meaningful. So it's a really important aspect of increasing missing middle housing um, because resident opposition is one of the most difficult hurdles to get over when proposing new housing. In the past and historically, the planning process has predominantly engaged white male homeowners. It's important to consider how this has shaped the city and how our neighborhoods, as well as regulatory and zoning processes have been shaped by this. So the question is who's being asked for their input, why, who isn't being asked, and why aren't they engaged? So in response to that, in 2016, the city established the planning review panel to respond to the need to provide more fair representation of historically marginalized and under-engaged populations. This has been a success in allowing for diverse residents and ethnicity, age, and income to provide feedback on a wide spectrum of planning topics. Next slide, please. So back to the design, um, what uh, we're calling neighborhood fit or character. It's a very hot topic and I can already see comments discussing it. So um, we think this is a very delicate balance between having respect for the existing design of a community with the desire for new housing forms that may prioritize the size of a home over neighborhood fit. And that's usually market driven. We can't ignore the fact that historically in the past, resident opposition to development projects related to fit was sometimes used as a way to not only exclude certain types of housing, but also certain types of people. 
So the question is, who fits, what fits, and who decides what fits? An example I'll give is that renters, uh, renters versus homeowners, and there was a very old idea that rental properties being nearby someone's home will reduce a home's property value. Um, this in the past has had its root in classism and racism, and it implicitly works to keep an outgroup out of the community. That being said, there are objective examples how new, of how new development has made no effort to fit with the design of the existing neighborhood. So we're gonna show some examples of where density can be added without sacrificing neighborhood fit and incorporating contemporary design principles. Next slide. So here's an image here. Um, so uh, as we said, it's a pain point for a lot of residents when redevelopment is being proposed, particularly in the yellow belt. So there's an added challenge in separating issues of lack of fit from personal taste because it is sometimes down to whether you like the look of a building um, but there are certain design principles that we can refer to that would make it more objective. So in this picture, um, you can see this is an example of a housing typology that some may argue doesn't fit with the neighborhood character. Next slide, please. This is another one. So you can see stark differences in height, the materials that were used in the overall style of the home between the newer building and the older ones. In the new building, the garage door is the focal point of the design rather than the porch, which is the focal point of the older, uh, older buildings. Also, this home is not reflective of the contemporary style, um, which is a design principle best practice. Next slide, please. So, some ways to get around the issue of fit. The first one is invisible, invisible density, which um, is adding density to a home without changing the exterior. So, there's no way to tell from the outside of the house that there's, there's additional units inside. Um, in this image, uh, this is an example. So there's a multi-unit home alongside other single family homes. And from where we're standing on the street, you actually can't tell which it is. So which is it? Next slide, please. This one. This is 254 Havelock Street. Um, and you can see in the diagram that it actually has three units inside of it. But from the exterior, it looks the same as the neighbors. Next slide. Um, so the second option is a gentle density redevelopment. So how do we add gentle density while still respecting the neighborhood character? Next slide. Uh, this is it. So, um, what we're calling visible density. So this is the Midtown Triplex by Studio JCI in the Allen B neighborhood. This is what we're saying is an, um, a great example of how to balance fit density and contemporary design. So the single family home includes one or two additional units. There's an existing home with a contemporary third floor addition and interior retrofit. So they used brick and wood on the exterior which complements the neighborhood. Um, and they were able to match the exterior materials with the existing uh, neighbor's homes. Um, there is a height difference, but they match the eaves line of the neighboring home, so the height differential is less obvious. Next slide. Here's another example. This is the Grange Triple Double by Williamson Williamson in Chinatown. This is a, an existing property that was split into three separate units, um, where a single family home was replaced with a multi unit building on one single lot. Next slide, please. We have a laneway house. This is a Leslieville Laneway House by Lanescape Incorporated in Leslieville. Um, so this was a conversion of an existing garage into a full-sized home where they were able to preserve the industrial character of the building and the surrounding community. A laneway suite is a self-contained residential unit located in an existing home's rear yard next to a laneway. There was a very extensive engagement process conducted around passing laneway suites regulation and many considered a success. So a uh, laneway suite is generally smaller in scale and it's completely detached from the main house on the lot. It's often behind the house and usually it's not visible from the main street. So issues of fit are a lot less prevalent. So in the top image, you can see um, on the right, that's the, that's the laneway suite. And on the bottom is the view from the street and you can barely see the laneway suite in that next one. Uh, the third, Third option is lot severance. So we're an ex you split an existing lot into two. Um, next one, please. 
This is an example of the double duplex home by Bate Soroba Architects in Parkdale. Uh, in this example, the existing property was split into two buildings with three separate tenants occupying each building. Again, they use brick and wood on the exterior, which complements the neighbors. The design is contemporary, but it still matches materials with the neighboring homes. And that's all for me. On to the next group. Thank you. Great. So thanks so much. Uh, coming up next is team two. Uh, Richard Borbridge, a new station sponsor of Metrolinks, will uh, give his uh, presentation. Thanks so much. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Sahar. Uh, I'm a senior manager at Metrolinks and a renter. I'm speaking on behalf of our team of planners, architects, engineers, and financial leaders uh, who have explored the development and approvals process in Toronto and beyond. You can go to the next slide. The foundation of the approval process really lies in the official plan. It creates a vision and a descriptive framework for the future development of the city, what you want to do. The zoning bylaw is about precision. Uh, it's a prescriptive document that implements the vision by setting more prescriptive planning policies for required setbacks, building size, height, and use throughout the city. So it basically tells us what we can and can't do on a particular site. Next. This map that we've seen a couple of times tonight is supposed to represent the neighborhoods in Toronto. But the idea of neighborhoods that the OP talks about isn't always achieved because they're not the walkable, sustainable places that community engagement consistently um, speaks about. The next. Over 35% of the city's land use is designated as neighborhoods, the, the yellow belt. The neighborhoods are made up of zoning on every lot, ranging from the most common RS and RD zones to the most permissive R zone. The official plan allows for every type. Zoning is the limitation on specific lots, with RS and RD being most common and also most restrictive. Next. So the problem is that the official plan is seeking density and sustainable growth. We've seen from the discussion today the value and importance of these characteristics. The zoning that's in place, combined with the process to change it, makes it challenging for developers, large and small, to achieve that vision. Zoning is regulated by a long-standing process that involves several steps, depending on the complexity of the project. In the current system, there's anywhere from three to more than eight major steps, depending on the kind of change proposed. For a smaller house addition, you may want to meet planning staff for a pre-application, submit a building permit application, and will likely need to present at a committee of adjustment hearing. The bigger projects and more units that you add, the more steps are generally required. Time and development charges accumulate, and it can take around two years to get sign-offs, and developers may be responsible for over $60,000 per unit before construction even begins. To speak to some of the case studies that we looked at in uh, examining these precedents, we looked at 10 to understand the opportunities and challenges that have existed in bringing gentle density to Toronto's yellow belt recently. Imagine a couple who knew the neighborhood they wanted to live in, but recognized they didn't need all the space that local homes provided. They purchased a fixer upper as an investment in a hot housing market, looking to transform a single home into three units that would provide them with ongoing income and a space that was easier for them to maintain. Neighbors struggled with changes to the yard they'd lived beside for years. The parking requirements that were set out in the zoning would lead to conversion of the backyard effectively into a driveway and the removal of several beloved trees. How about a proposal for a walk-up apartment that's across from a park near a school and a mixed-use high street that could bring young family into an established urban neighborhood? An auto body repair shop on the land is zoned for industrial uses, which can lead to a challenging and lengthy process to change employment zoning into a residential zone. Zoning process as we know it today has been in place for decades. It provides an opportunity for community feedback on every project, and the level of scrutiny and process allows for checks and balances. 
So fewer big moves mean fewer big mistakes. But the current zoning hasn't been conducive to achieving the results like density and sustainability that we're talking about and we're often looking for. The review process can be lengthy, the timeline is variable, and where time is money, this matters. Cost is a huge factor. Administrative costs and charges on small projects can be prohibitive. Charges and fees may not be proportional to the potential development gains, whether real or perceived by a developer. With each application subject to its own review process, a community must respond to each application, leading to potential engagement fatigue. Jargon and local idiosyncrasies in zoning mean steep learning curves for potential small developers and for the community trying to work within that system to provide feedback. Zoning is an entrenched process built on incremental change, and the process may be complicated for the average homeowner to understand. Small and large projects can undergo similar types of scrutiny. Uh, a principle such as affordability can really only be considered on, on the site. So each proposal, um, or sorry, through each proposal, rather than taking a wider lens on how a project fits uh, within the broader neighborhood and what kind of affordability it can bring to a wider context. Zoning as a process to achieve the vision of the official plan is, we think, falling a bit short. It doesn't successfully serve the purpose of providing the certainty in implementing the official plan vision. And the protections built into the process can make it more difficult to achieve some of these broader policy objectives. The incremental approach to, of zoning has meant that citywide density targets will take a long time to realize. Local character, as Sahara was talking about, itself is a, a very difficult thing to describe. A basis toward preserving local character imposes additional challenges on top of the usual rules of zoning. We found that while, uh, while they were created to reflect local character, clauses around parking, setbacks, and servicing requirements can limit its site's potential and the opportunities to integrate successfully with local character. So what are the policy alternatives? What have other cities done that we can learn from? There are a lot of ways to add gentle density. It's happening in a lot of places, and in many places, these gentle density types of projects are happening faster. Toronto has introduced an as of right secondary suites uh, by law that makes achieving this form much easier. Uh, similar types of reforms in Los Angeles can lead to approvals of the same types of units as quickly as the same day. Seattle, as another instance, has introduced community vetted designs for gentle density solutions and accessory dwelling units, which are pre-approved for construction and saves a lot of those challenges. Zoning has been an historical tool for exclusion. It's premised on managing changes and it's based on an exercise of asking for permission. In Ontario, community planning permits are one strategy that can turn the conversation toward a collective vision with a focus on delivering that vision rather than just responding to incremental change. In neighborhoods struggling with change, whether overwhelmed by the number of development applications or frustrated by proposals that frequently miss the mark on design or scale, a community planning permit pilot project in Toronto could spark a discussion about the importance of growth of community capacity to serve an evolving demographic and how to make proposals for new units fit. The planning permit system is available to implement now in Ontario. Can you envision your community piling this kind of change? Perhaps in a neighborhood that needs more housing options or where the kinds of density being added to the neighborhood has not met the quality in terms of the character, uh, the quantity in terms of meeting a demand for housing, or the variety in only seeing single detached homes or tall condominium towers in a particular neighborhood. So the community planning permit system achieves many objectives. Uh, a bigger but more concise role for community engagement, an explicit regulation of urban design, architecture, and character, and a simplified application process once the permit system bylaw has been enacted. But setting it up is front-loaded, and it does impose a relatively fixed vision within fixed boundaries. 
drawing a line around a neighborhood uh, and building to that vision can be difficult. It needs to be done right to ensure that all community voices can and do participate. A consensus on the neighborhood's future is vital as a piece of that. Would the vision that you bring be the same as your neighborhoods? So our team's presentation tried to summarize some of the challenges and opportunities that exist in trying to develop sites today. There are many ways to enhance and streamline the development approvals process or change it to help the yellow belt through, uh, grow through, yellow gen through gentle density. We'll leave you with a few of these questions to consider and uh, thank you for your time and interest today. Fantastic. Thanks so much. And uh, some really good ideas there, looking at the process uh, as well. And, and so far as looking at um, the design element, uh, I want to introduce team three, uh, Jed Kilburn, uh, the development planning at Waterfront Toronto will be uh, speaking on behalf of their team. Uh, and uh, please go ahead. Hi, thanks, Andrew. Um, so what, one of the things that we, uh, we wanted to do was take a look at some of the cost implications of doing development in, in ex established neighborhoods. And part of the reason that we wanted to, we wanted to get a fairly targeted approach at figuring out um, if, if it were possible and what the, the levers might be to create more affordable housing or at least start trying to address some of the affordability uh, issues uh, that Toronto is facing. Uh, next slide, please. So. Our approach was we took uh, four case studies and we tried to locate them as much as possible in, uh, in actual existing projects. Um, and we did four different development scenarios and I'll go through, quickly go through what those scenarios are. Um, but we, uh, we also wanted to make sure we, we, we did used what, what in the development world is called a pro forma and that's a, a, an analysis of your costs and, um, and profits realized through a development. Um, and so what we ended up doing was looking at a uh, pro forma for rental. Um, you, you could do the same for a condominium or a single family home, but uh, we decided to look at uh, rental. And then we looked at the real large costs, so construction costs, the cost of land, if, if it's applicable, and any municipal fees and charges that might be added on to the cost of construction for building new units. Um, and we did that as a way of identifying some of the uh, potential barriers to creating affordable housing. Um, in order to do that, I have to give a couple key thank yous to uh, Ralph Palermo um, of PNR Developments, who helped us uh, work through some of our pro forma questions. Dean Goodman at uh, LGA Partners, uh, Architectural Partners, uh, for helping to sh who, who shared his uh, design concept with us that we could really use to model, and uh, Carolyn Ruhala, the director at uh, Impact Lending at Van City, who helped us also figure out some of the levers with respect to uh, addressing some of the missing middle density. So next slide, please. So we're looking at a single detached house designed typically for one family on its own lot. Next slide. And the first instance, we're looking at converting it into three units. So this is the, the, the kind of initial invisible density that we were talking about, exactly the same building and just creating three different units within that same shell. Next slide. The next is taking that same detached house and demolishing it to create three new units um, where the built form is different, but the, it's consistent with the, uh, with the permitted height, front yard, side yard, and rear yard setback. So it, it, it's, the, the, the form of it is permitted within the, the neighborhood. Next slide, please. Uh, same detached house and demolishing it to create 10 new units. And so I'll, I'll go into a little bit of what that, that ends up looking like. Um, so the built form is obviously different than the surroundings, but it's consistent with the same uh, development permissions um, and setbacks and, and height uh, as permitted uh, in, in the neighborhood. Next slide. And then finally, in order to get a sense of the range of, of density, we wanted to take a look at, um, at the, the kind of amalgamation of two lots. So taking two uh, single detached houses and assembling them to create a 20 un 28 unit uh, rental building. Um, and we did that because of the, the examples throughout the city, um, not that many, but the examples of, of, of kind of more apartment style uh, uh, dwelling, dwellings in neighborhoods. Next slide, please. So why would we study a case, do a 
case study approach, largely because we, we wanted to base it on real world examples, um, as well as to understand what the, the financial barriers might be to this kind of development, and then also see if there were opportunities for us to identify things that could be explored further as the city kind of ex, uh, explores the idea of, um, of development in the Yellow Belt residential development. Next slide, please. So we looked at um, four different sites. The sites have migrated, apparently. <laughs> the numbers in the sites have migrated. But what you see here is we looked at um, four sites, two of which are in the former city of Toronto, one in York and one in uh, the, the east side of the former city of Toronto. Um, these were the examples that we had found. Um, obviously, there are other neighborhoods in the city that we could probably run similar exercises with, but for, uh, for our purposes, these are the ones that we chose. Next slide, please. So the first case study, next slide. This is uh, 254 Havelock Street. You're now well familiar with that. Um, next slide, please. And it's the existing house that has been transformed into three units within that house. Next slide. And the next slide. So uh, the 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 it exists within an R zone, um, and the the vision for the development was uh, in an internal reconfiguration. So basically, just doing a fairly extensive renovation. Um, we assumed that uh, it would be broken into a triplex. Um, rental housing with no parking um, and you could you could do that without any variances or site plan amendment and the whole process start to finish we we imagined would take about 13 months next slide please and one of the things that we wanted to do in terms of an affordability lens is we took the idea uh, of of affordability at 80 percent of the cmhc average market rent for um for the city of toronto but we wanted to look at affordability within the neighborhood and so we took the uh the median household income in the neighborhood and uh we looked at what would be considered an affordable rent now we understand that there's other other ways of measuring affordability um, but for for our intents and purposes we were using the one in the official plan um, and one of the things that we wanted to point out is that in order to break even um, and and to make this a viable project you'd want to to be recouping on the additional units about sixteen hundred and fifty dollars a month on average the other thing that we realized is that a lot of the, the municipal fees and charges that are associated with this kind of development, so development charges, uh, including parkland dedication, um, cost an awful lot. They're about almost 40,000 in this, in this building, almost 40,000 per new unit. Um, but if those charges were waived, you end up with a rent that's about one thousand five hundred and fifty dollars a month, uh, which is become becomes within the realm of affordable. Uh, next slide, please. And the next. And the next, 68 Burnaby Boulevard. Here's the one that we took an existing home and next slide and converted it into three new units. Next slide, please. So we demolished the existing dwelling. It's in an R zone, so you didn't need variant. We, we didn't imagine that you needed variances or site plan uh, or site plan amendment. Um, and it's a triplex with the family suite on the top two levels. Um, it's rental and we, we didn't assume any parking. So those are other ways that when you don't assume parking, it's another way of, uh, or certainly below grade parking, it's another way of uh, making sure that you uh, are, are keeping your costs low. And start to finish, we figured that this would take about two years, so 24 months. Next slide, please. And uh, the rent required, this, for a new unit would be about $3,000 a month. Um, in a neighborhood where the median household income is $77,000 a month, the actual affordability is about $1,900 a month. Um, but if you, if, and if you waive the municipal fees, um, you'd, you'd probably save about $115,000 and that would allow you to bring your rents a little bit lower than the 3,000, but actually not that much, um, not enough to make it affordable. So all of a sudden you're starting to see that the affordability of building something new becomes a lot more challenging. Next slide, please. Next slide. Here's our easternmost, thank you. <laughs> One house being split into, next slide, please. Uh, 10 new units and next slide. 
So this was an existing uh, uh, 50 by 150 foot lot uh, with an existing single detached dwelling in an R zone. Um, we demolished it and severed it um, as, as a proposal, um, but, um, and we're providing rental housing. Um, we're assuming no parking um, and again, no variances. And from start to finish, this would take about 28, uh, 28 months. Next slide, please. We wanted to propose two, eight, eight two bedroom units with two laneway houses. And you start realizing that the, the even taking away from the, um, from the develop, removing the development charges, which are close to $500,000, you end up with about 1,800 to $3,000 a month worth uh, in rent um, in, an, in a neighborhood where there's about $1,700, um, it would be, would be considered affordable. So this is some of the lower, the, 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 the two bedroom units might approach the affordability, but certainly the, the, the cost for the houses is a lot significantly more. And then finally, our last case study, I'll zip through because I understand that we're out of time, um, is on Marley. And this is the, the assembly into 20 units. If you could go to the next slide and the next slide. So uh, two adjacent lots, uh, 28 uh, units, uh, 10 one bedrooms, 18 two bedrooms. From start to finish, this would take about 48 months. So this ends, ends up being a fairly significant period of time. And next slide, please. And you start realizing that if the fees were waived, uh, your affordability is still um, higher than what would be affordable. So a one bedroom at 2000 and a two bedroom at 2200 is still significantly less affordable than a 1500 or $1,600 a month rent. Finally, um, in terms of how to make this uh, work, uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. Some of the considerations obviously um, would be no development charges or parkland dedication, um, which would reduce your, your municipal costs significantly. Um, some of the other things that we explored were a prefabricated kit of parts that may have been pre-approved, so it would lessen your timeline for development. If you wanted to get even more uh, aggressive, you could suggest city loans for new affordable rental or abil an ability for small scale developers to take out CMHC insurance um, or you could have support uh, municipal support for nonprofit land trust to preserve some of the rental units in existing neighborhoods um, or you could look at not providing hst for new affordable rental and so those would be some of the ways that you could start addressing uh, affordability through uh, gentle density and i'll leave it there great thanks so much jen appreciate it um we were just a, a few minutes over time, but if you'll indulge us, we have we want to uh, want to provide a bit more feedback and discussion. Um, and I really appreciate the teams uh, really digging in over the last few months to talk and, and look at hey, look at process options, uh, look at design options, uh, and and really dig in and look at financial barriers and say, well, how how do we make these more? Uh, affordable and they looked at waiving fees, potentially that an option, you know, can you defer or amortize? So it's great to see them searching for solutions. Uh, I do want to just end on um, really amazing work. Uh, I, I've been asked to give a bit of, a bit of an editorial um, look and, and, and to speak everyone. Uh, a lot of people introduce themselves professionally and also want to talk personally. Uh, and, and I think there is a personal uh, aspect to the yellow belt and and, and I want to address that and I also want to give an opportunity we've had a uh, Greg Lintern who's the chief uh, planner for Toronto uh, and and I want to give him some an opportunity to talk about the city planning response and uh, the next steps um, so hopefully you can hang on for that uh, you know personally um, you know I'm not just a, a black professional but you know in, in these times uh, I have, have to say I'm, I'm a proud Torontonian, I'm a father, uh, I'm a husband, um, and, and, and I'm a caregiver for, for, for my parents that live in, in the West End, so really um, enjoy a lot of Toronto's neighborhoods. Uh, and, and I think one of the things that's really important as we look to some of these solutions that um, we deal with some of the uncomfortable truth that the Yellow Belt 
or the missing middle is is not only a neutral zoning bylaw. It, it uh, as, as some people have hinted before, it perpetuates exclusivity among equity seeking groups and, and within that, uh, especially disproportionately uh, impacts uh, many people, including the black community. And I can say that from, from a lived experience and uh, as, as the teams and, and, and everyone here, because we all have work uh, are included in city building, um, as we as we group, look for solutions, uh, we want to have them, and and we want to look to make sure that they include elements that dismantle some of that systemic uh, exclusion. So I'll talk just briefly on a few, um, and 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 I think as we look to make the process more inclusionary, as we look to make um, uh, the zoning more inclusionary, uh, as the groups have highlighted. It, a lot of them talked about areas about access, they talked about affordability, and talked about fit. And um, uh, to talk a little bit about those uh, from, from at least the Black lived experience. And, uh, in terms of accessibility, I think sometimes we always say access to who. Um, and um, by excluding these housing uh, choices, we've limited access to public amenities near this huge swath of Toronto and limited access to public amenities that can be enjoyed by all. Um, and uh, that limited access uh, disproportionately impacts people, black, indigenous people of color. And <clears throat> those who have not had access to those schoolyards, those trails, those splash pads, uh, a lot of them are connected into these areas, these missing middle areas. And, and, and they're quite underutilized as people go away for the summer and so on. Um, a lot of these other areas that are in high density don't have access to these amenities. So it's really important uh, that we find solutions and creative solutions that uh, don't just create accessibility, but accessibility to all. Um, and same thing about affordability. Uh, and, and, and I think as we look to make, we've talked about affordable rental, uh, I think it's important uh, that we we don't stigmatize renters and, and and i think there were some great good points on how uh renters can be stigmatized or stereotyped uh and just by having rental available in these areas um doesn't also create access to everyone because you know there's been some harvard research that found widespread discrimination against who gets to rent you know if, if there's someone who has a black sounding name um uh, they've done tests of where People have changed their online profile, and when they presented differently, uh, they were able to get access to rent where they weren't before. So it's a very important as we look at those solutions in terms of uh, affordability uh, that we look at that as well. And my daughter, hi, the hundreds of people there watching. Um, so uh, and and I, you know, I really want to. Um, I, I know we're short on time, so I, I think one of the things is as we look for these solutions, we, we want to not just challenge the, uh, the technical requirements, but understand the cultural implications and the cultural exclusion that's included in these. And, and I know, um, Greg, you know, I've had a, had a chance to speak to him, and I think he's um, uh, a, a good listener and, and, and has a, a big mandate in front of him, and he's been a uh, a strong um, champion for transit expansion, for housing affordability, and uh, I want to give him the opportunity to uh, speak to uh, what are the, some of the next steps and one of the things that we're looking at uh, going forward. So thank you, Greg. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Thank you for your leadership. Uh, that was an amazing uh, number of presentations. Everybody can hear me, correct? Good. Uh, really, really um, good discussion from the from the panel. Um, I kind of got this inclusive coalition vibe out of the panel. Uh, I just took down a few notes because I I took a couple of pages of notes actually. But I think you know I heard what I heard people say is that uh, the neighborhoods are really part of everyone's future. And that's kind of an important idea. Uh, 
the importance of walking in uh, everyone's shoes, uh, in other people's shoes, the, uh, that, that idea of equity, I think, is, came through in the panel discussion. Uh, I definitely heard uh, from, from Kathy that, you know, new typologies and, and um, uh, character are not mutually exclusive. I mean, that's a point that I think we have to remember that it's not a choice between uh, change and, and all of the things that people really enjoy about their neighborhoods. Uh, that neighborhoods aren't just houses, that, that there's a, they're, they're, they are a social space, they're, they may, they're made up of the areas around the neighborhoods where people shop, their schools, and importantly, the, the places where people come together. Um, Sahar's comment about uh, who does it fit, I wrote that down, I thought that was uh, meaningful in so many ways. Uh, Richard's point about uh, what we want and what we get. Uh, really interesting uh, kind of dichotomy between the aspiration and the exclusion that we've spoken about tonight. Uh, Jed's uh, summary of uh, financial feasibility. Uh, you know, uh, all of us who are in this business, uh, we know that uh, financial feasibility is where uh, good ideas go to retire sometimes. So we really have to make sure that we uh, think about that. I think if you put up the slide for me, I'm just going to give you a little um, appetizer, if you will, of what's ahead for us. Uh, again, I want to thank ULI and the community and the, and the Kirtner teams. I think it was a powerful evening. And um, I think, you know, in the past, this program has created a, uh, some energy around uh, and some momentum around uh, how we want to uh, change specific areas of the city. But in this, in this case, it's more of a, as Deputy Mayor pointed out, a generational conversation about what we expect in the next decades from our neighborhoods and, and the social, really the social benefits that can be derived from, uh, or, or the non-physical benefits that can be derived from the physical changes that we could uh, support in neighborhoods. So what you're going to see in a couple of weeks is, um, is a report which um, kind of launches a conversation around the types of changes that uh, we think are important for Toronto's future. Um, you know, this, this uh, slide just shows you six verbs, but uh, really engagement, we've started that engagement already. This, this evening is part of it, but we've already started engagement with the planning review panel, with community associations across the city. We've even done uh, some old fashioned door to door stuff before COVID. Um, and it's a really, it is a topic, there's no question that uh, engages Torontonians and it's something that will underpin everything that we do on this uh, going forward. Um, Enable is about um, how we expand permissions. Um, you know, let's be straight up about that. Uh, so much of what you saw tonight is ideas around how we introduce uh, more permission so that housing options are broadened out. Um, the, the facilitate is around kind of unlocking and debugging. You heard that from some of the, the presentations tonight, whether it be financial or otherwise, that needs to happen. There is more study work to do these presentations, and I hope there are reports behind them, but uh, they, they, they reveal that th there's more detail underneath. Um, you know, what are the carbon benefits from, from neighborhood change? What are the uh, infrastructure gaps that we have to think about? Uh, people will ask questions where we always need to have good answers. Um, piloting, you know, I, I think, Many, many uh, missing middle units have been built, whether they be visible or invisible, and we have to continue to experiment and pilot and bring new ideas to the table. Uh, certainly monitoring as well. So, uh, you know, in the last uh, 10 odd years, uh, where missing middle housing is permitted in Toronto, about 2,600 units have been created. Uh, and and they, like so many of the presenters, you don't, you don't notice them. So this is something that we need to continue to do if we want to evaluate our success. The policy and regulatory change will be just that. 
if we don't uh, actually monitor our performance and see how well we do. So this is, uh, like I said, an appetizer for a report that we'll be sending to Planning and Housing Committee. It'll be publicly available uh, in, uh, I think, July the 6th or so on the city's website. And we certainly look forward to uh, the future engagement around this topic. And again, I just wanted to acknowledge all of the, uh, the effort that everybody made tonight and, uh, and Andrew's leadership in talking about the inclusivity of the city that is so vitally important as we continue, uh, as we continue with this conversation going forward. Thank you. Okay, I'll jump in, I think, just to uh, close things out. Richard Joy again. Um, thank you to everybody for participating uh, and listening in on this uh, a long uh, town hall meeting and on the Zoom format. Um, special thanks to our community reps, uh, Deputy Mayor Malau, Greg Lintern, and especially the three teams of ULI, Kertner Leadership, Mid-Career Program Participants for this year. Um, that was quite a year. Um, uh, it took a lot of twists and turns to get here. Um, but I think we delivered a really interesting launch to what we'll now hand over to the city as the formal process uh, going forward. Um, so thank you all. Uh, and uh, we'll, of course, be staying very closely attached to um, this file as it, uh, as it moves forward. All the best and good night.